Advent, Latin for coming. And Voskamp writes, you can see it during Advent over on the west side in the slum, over the backyard fence, right down the hall, in a way someone reaches out their hand and someone else grabs hold. There in that grip lies love. Everyone, everywhere, no matter what, is really always saying only one thing. I just want you to love me. Love amazing, love divine, the essence of Christmas time. That's the gift we want. That's the gift we get. And that's the gift we get to give. Christmas is a love story, the love story that has been coming for you since before time began. Advent will keep coming, his love always coming again and again for us. The love that enveloped Abraham, Isaac, Jacob and Joseph, Samuel, David, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Mary, Elizabeth, the Magi. That same love has come for us. Love, the fourth candle of Advent. are here we um, are I love Christmas how many give me some emojis if you guys who loves Christmas I absolutely love this season I love so many things about it oh there's some of you that I love the music I think most of all I love Christmas music I love decorating my house I love the fact that I can decorate my house um, in celebration of Jesus birthday I love um, how even when people are really busy, they, I don't know if you find it where you live, but where I live, even when they're busy, they seem to be courteous, a little more courteous, a little more friendly. Um, now there's those impatient ones as well, but for the most part, but you know, the, the thing that I love most this year is the fact that, um, how it, some of you have not been to this service maybe during the month of December, maybe not at all. And if you've never come before, welcome. But how many people are familiar with the word Advent? Can you give me emoji? Give me emojis if you have not heard that word before. Advent. Zero. It's so great to see you, Zero. Okay, so what Advent is, it's a Latin word that means coming. And during the month of December, some Christian churches practice of Advent. So we have two different kinds of Advent. One is every Sunday during December, we light a candle um, that represents something for Advent. So the first week of the first Sunday was um, hope. The second Sunday was peace. Last Sunday was joy. And this, this is the fourth Sunday before Christmas, and it is now um, the candle um, of love today. So the other thing is that during the month of December, um, you can also participate daily in Advent. So if you actually um, go Google or hit an Amazon in your country or whatever, you could probably find devotional books easily that cover the 25 days of Christmas from December 1st to the 25th. So I've been hosting an event in here at Allspace VR every day since December 1st. And we've been doing a devotional for 30 minutes. The devotional part lasts for about 20 minutes every morning. And morning in my time zone, I'm in Canada. And 
it has been the most ex amazing experience to spend time every single day um, just, number one, acknowledging that um, the greatest gift we could possibly imagine is that God loves us and that he came down for us. He gave us this amazing gift and said that we didn't have to go find him. We don't have to work to find him. He came down to us. And that's what we get to celebrate, the coming of his, um, that himself, who was the greatest gift to us. And so, so um, concentrating on that every day um, throughout the month of December. And um, it has just been the most amazing experience. And so I encourage you um, for the last couple days um, now before Christmas or keeping it in mind for next year um, to take time to um, spend time with God during the month of Advent. We want to do it all the time, but um, focusing on um, an Advent season has just been an incredible experience. Okay. So to start with, so my welcome is wherever you are in your spiritual journey, whether you believe in God or not, we're just so glad that you decided to join us for this um, Sunday service. And we just hope that no matter what, that you feel welcome and that you feel accepted. There is, God loves you with such an unconditional love. There is literally not a single thing on that can separate you from his love. He loves you so much. And when you're here for a service, we just feel, we just hope that you feel that love. And that when you leave us, that you know that you take that love with you. It doesn't stay behind because this is a church. That love is for you wherever you are. And that's what we hope. For those of you who are new, and especially if you're relatively new to um, VR, um, just know that if you click your cursor, click your controller, I mean, click your controller on an avatar, there's a person behind that avatar just like you. So we want to be kind to people. If you click on that avatar, you will see a name badge. And that will tell you the person. If it's a black room around it, you're not friends with them. There's a friend um, thing on the badge that you can become friends with somebody. But I just want to point out there's a block option. And if you ever feel like you're in an uncomfortable situation, if somebody's making you uncomfortable or harassing you in any way, feel free to block that person, okay? The last housekeeping thing that I'd like to, um, well, well, one housekeeping thing I'd like to say is the conversation at church here at our service only begins in VR at this service on Sundays. It carries on with life groups in um, Altspace Rec Room and VR Chat. And we also have an amazing Discord channel that you guys can join. Um, if you head over to our website, vrchurch.org, just vrchurch.org, there's a Discord button. If you are have not familiar with Discord, just click it. You'll join our server, and there's all sorts of conversations you can participate in. The last thing that I want to say from a housekeeping perspective is that Allspace, like other social VR pro, um, platforms, we have sometimes a problem with trolls. And I use the word trolls um, for a very... Um, specific reason. There's people that come in to events simply to disrupt the event. They don't come to participate in the event. They don't come um, they come they don't come to play nice. They come exactly opposite. They come um, to disrupt. And it's not only VR church, it's it's all sorts of different types of social um, VR um, per, um, events. So what I want to do is just start with this short prayer and I want you guys just to pray along with me. And we just um, Every time somebody comes into an event and is disrespectful to the event, that person is suffering in some way. We don't know. They're looking for something, they're, whatever, they're, and they're acting out inappropriately. And we don't know what the problem is. But here at VR Church, we want to pray for them. And so sometimes if somebody uses foul language here, they immediately get kicked out. I, that's the only thing that I will not tolerate um, in this space. Um, but when, um, when people are acting out, so for instance, if an avatar comes in and is touching you inappropriately, um, that's rude. And we just want to do it. And if somebody comes in like that, we just want to give them extra prayer, okay? Just keep that in mind, you guys. Feel free to block that person if they're making you feel uncomfortable. But at the top of your mind, let's just start off with a prayer. Dear God, we come before you today, and we're so grateful that you can bring people from so many countries and so many different places around the world into this space 
so we can celebrate the fourth Sunday of Advent, so we can worship you, so that we can together learn from your word. And as we go through Luke 2 today, I just ask that if there's anybody that comes in to disrupt this service, that they would feel the touch of your love, that they would understand that um, just as you love each one of us, you love them. And that we, um, you would help us to, um, to manage um, those situations. We ask this in your precious name. Amen. Okay, so for those of you who have not been to VR Church before, <coughs> excuse me, behind me, we're just about to go into and do a walkthrough interactive experience. And the chapter of the Bible that we're going to look at in its entirety today is Luke 2. Now, what will happen is later in during the week, we'll have life groups that dig into the chapter a little bit deeper than what we can um, actually do today. But we'll, um, we'll go through. Now, um, what I would love to is have your participation. If anybody is willing to help read scripture, I want you to know, um, first of all, Justice is here in the green with the red and white hat, and he's helping me manage um, reading scripture today. And down on your bottom right, there is a, um, a button that says raise hand. If you are interested in helping read some verses, <coughs> please just go ahead and click that raise hand button. And what Justice will do is amplify your voice at a particular time so that you can help read. So if you raise your hand, Justice knows that you're willing to read and that we'll deal with that as we go through. So we're going to enter into the space that our wonderful uh, world builder, Wilco, has designed for us. And I'm going to start and I'm going to read um, the first seven verses. That's, um, that's actually the beginning of Luke 2 and um, relates to the birth of Jesus. Um, the second part is um, when we get introduced to the shepherds. So for now... Um, if you guys just want to follow me or somebody else wants to take the lead, somebody's going to help, help me not get lost today. And we're going to go um, through here. Oh, actually, ah, I should watch what I say. The first three verses are right just to our left, you guys. So I'm going to start here. I'm just going to take a drink of water. Okay, at that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus, and decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when, um, oh, sorry, I forgot to look up this, Eucarius was governor of Syria. I butchered that name, I apologize. All returned to their own ancestral towns to register for the census. Okay, so now we're going to carry on in here. Um, and just keeping in mind that um, right now we can get, we get a census in the mail or something. I don't know what every other country does, but... We get, a, get something in the mail and we fill it out and, or maybe we reply to a phone call. Back then, they literally had to travel back to their ancestral home. So it was a pretty big deal to do that census. So in verse 4 it says, And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged, who was now expecting a child. Okay, so he takes his pregnant wife and goes back to, um, goes to Bethlehem so that they can be counted in the census. Okay, so the last two verses of this section say, And while they were there, the time had come for her, Mary's baby, to be born. And she gave birth. To her firstborn son, she wrapped him in, um, sorry, I'm just going to go a bit closer, in snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. Okay, so this is in essence, in these seven verses, Luke really gives us the Christmas story. He tells us exactly about Jesus' birth. So Luke is somebody, he's a doctor, he's a physician. Um, turned historian, and he tells us um, about um, the birth of Jesus. Now, this was actually prophesied um, by the Hebrew prophet Micah 700 years 
before the coming of the Messiah in Bethlehem. 700 years in Micah 5 verse 2 um, said, um, But as for you, Bethlehem, too little to be among the clans of Judah, from one you will go forth for me to be a ruler in Israel, his goings forth from a long ago, from the days of eternity. So Jesus was, prof um, they prophesied of Jesus' birth. 700 years later, a teenage couple, descendants of King David, living in Nazareth, take that few days journey from Bethlehem. Like, it takes them a few days to get there. Can you imagine a, a pregnant woman in, um, in any kind of mode of trans transportation at that time traveling? But they get to Bethlehem. And so this is one thing. When you guys think about Bethlehem, most of the pictures we have of Bethlehem, if you've noticed, are not during the day, they're at night. Most of them have the star, right? Because that's a significant thing about Bethlehem, the shepherd saw, or the wise men saw the star. And isn't the town always peaceful? We always think about peaceful Bethlehem. But this was a census. This was a huge event. The reason that Mary had to put her baby the reason Jesus first bed, um, we call it a manger, but it probably was a feeding trough. The reason was because there was literally nowhere else to stay. And that's because the town was flooding, with, was overflowing with people who had come back to take partic um, participate in the census. So I can imagine that that sleepy image of Bethlehem has nothing to do necessarily with reality. It was somebody's image of, you know, Bethlehem, how lowly you are among. Um, it really wasn't that lowly. It must have been busting at the seams. And my guess is that um, everybody was hurrying and scurrying around. Now, can you imagine? This is like, um, I don't know if you guys have family gatherings, but there's all these people getting together that haven't seen each other for a long time. Their families knew each other, you know, you know, years and years ago. So I can imagine there was lots of um, parties and lots of um, people just moving around. So I don't think this town was lowly or quiet at all. I think it was probably very noisy. And amongst all of that, Jesus' birth just got lost. It's just like they were in a stable because that's the only place they could find. He was in a feeding trough because they literally didn't have a bed. And yet that was God's timing. God could have planned Jesus' birth for any time. But it was part of his plan that Jesus came to earth for us and that he came in an unassuming way. The wise men, we, we remember, the wise men went immediately to the palace in Jerusalem because they assumed that the king, the Messiah that was prophesied, must have been at the palace. He's a king. And yet they found him as a lowly commoner living in Bethlehem. And um, so I just, it's a, it's a different visual um, than what I think um, the pictures come, that come to mind are. Um, so um, um, Luke is just, Luke wants to share the facts with us. So he tells us the story. Um, I'm just going to, um, going to catch up with my notes here so Jesus himself was a miracle his birth was a miracle and um, okay so the question and we're going to talk more about this at life group but I don't think God was confused about this at all God's timing God's work goes quietly among um, hidden places all the time and he um, Philippians 2 Chapter 2, verse 6 and 7, it says, Although he existed in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bond servant and being made in the likeness of men. And in 2 Corinthians it says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor that you through his poverty might become rich. You know, he left the glory of heaven to come and live on earth with the knowledge of the fact that he would pay the price for our sins. 
That's remarkable. The inn where they stayed wasn't a five-star hotel by any means. It was an enclosure. It was a place where they kept animals. And the innkeeper, he didn't do it on purpose. He literally, his inn was busting with people. There was literally nowhere else for God to go. And in the end, God provided. Mary and Joseph had what they absolutely needed. They had shelter. And um, and so that, the innkeeper, sometimes it'd be, oh, Alan, welcome here, Alan. Um, it would be interesting um, to take, just consider the story a little bit from the innkeeper. At some point, we're going to do that, of what that must have felt like. But um, he did what he could. Um, this was all he had, and he gave Mary and Joseph all he had. So in Life Group, we're going to talk a little bit about um, making room for Jesus, um, how we do that, we, we, and from um, thinking about um, the perspective of the innkeeper. Okay, so now we're going to carry on to the proclamation of his birth, and we're going to talk about um, uh, from the shepherd's perspective. So let's move through here. And Justice, do you have somebody that could read verses 8 through um, 14? Oh, hang on. Sorry. <clears throat> yeah, go ahead, Mike. You're, you're, you're on. Okay. That night, there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them, and they were terrified. But the angel reassured them don't be afraid he said i bring you good news that they will bring great joy to all people this the savior yes the messiah the lord has been born today bethlehem the city of david and you will recognize him by the sign you will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth lying in a manger. Then suddenly the angel was joined by a host of, of others. Enemies of heaven praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to those whom God is pleased. Oh, thank you so much. That was awesome. Now, uh, Justice, is there somebody else that could do 15 through um, 20? Uh, I don't... Oh, sorry, I'm online. No. Oh. Uh, when the angels had to return it to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see the thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. Uh, and then we have 16. Yeah, all the way to 20, Paul. Okay, though. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph. And they, and there was the baby, lying in the manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everybody what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherds no, all who heard the shepherd's story were astonished, but Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. Okay, so yeah. let's, um, so everybody, take a moment to just experience um, Wilco's rendition of um, the stable. Just take some time to just stand in there. What it must have been like to have a child and put that child into a feeding trough. They had a little bit of straw. I don't know. It doesn't say um, they had a swaddling cloth. That's all it says. Um, but this is this is where the Messiah, our Savior, the Son of God, um, the Divine, um, this is where he was born. And it's such a lowly, um, um, humble place. Now, 
imagine that Jesus is born and most people are excited, right? When a baby is born, most people are very excited. Mary and Joseph came back to Bethlehem, and it doesn't talk in the Bible about them meeting family there. I don't know what the scenario is about that, but there isn't like family members that are rushing to um, come and visit the child or um, be excited with Mary, Joseph and Mary. Who does God go to? God decides that the very first celebration of Jesus' birth should be some shepherds outside the town of Bethlehem. Now, let's think about shepherds for a second. I'm, I don't have a lot of um, documentation in front of me about shepherds, um, but I do know a little bit. They were most often poor. They were almost always despised, and they were downtrodden. This was not um, something that um, w was held in high regard in um, the social status of the period of time, the culture that they lived in. And they were, they were looked down upon, they were excluded from society. The rabbis at that time despised them. They called them next door to heathen. They were involved in the mundane, the, re, um, the routine keeping of the woolies in the night. Can you imagine they were, these, the sheep that they tended were probably temple sheep. So that means that they were unblemished lambs that were going to be sacrificed at the morning or evening sacrifices in Jerusalem in the temple. So here you have these shepherds who are looked down upon, they're probably scruffy, and what do they do? They spend their time just guarding the sheep, making sure the sheep don't wander off, making sure the sheep don't get caught up in thickets and, and, um, and different in the, um, the trees and stuff around. These men, um, and we usually think about shepherds as men, so I have no comment about if there was female shepherds, I do not know that. Um, but they were, um, people that must have um, enjoyed, or I think you have to come to peace with the fact that they must have enjoyed spending a lot of time with their thoughts because they were always alone, um, or maybe there's a couple of them together, but they had this really lonely job. Now, this group of people, do you think that they had any idea about what was about to happen with the Messiah or any understanding when what would, what, was about to happen like did they actually get it what what did the what did um the birth of jesus look like from the shepherds there's another interesting take on um the christmas story but at, so god passed over the self-important he passed over the high priest remember herod the great herod was terrorizing people the jewish religious leaders the pharisees the theologians the politicians um, in Rome and in Jerusalem, God overlooked all of those people who were had status, right? Those were the people who had status in the community. He looked overlooked all those people, and he went to the men in the in the um, in the in the hills that were looking after animals. I, I can't imagine. So in that quiet night. So they're just laying there watching, keeping watch. In that quiet night, suddenly the glory of the Lord flashed around them. There was a heavenly brightness, a manifestation of God's presence and a power. Can you imagine um, some of you experienced um, in Acts? Um, I, I want to say it's chapter 7, I think, where um, mo they, we ha had the rendition of the uh, burning bush, right? So that magnificent word, so we knew um, that Moses was, Moses was terrified when he saw the burning bush. Well, here you have that same experience where there's all this light. They're, they're used to being in darkness with just starlight, and now there's all this light, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And um, it must have encompassed them with the light. I can't even imagine what their first thought must be, except that just like every other time that angels come to anybody in um, the Bible, apparently people are afraid. That seems to be the first thing. So the shepherds 
I just can't imagine that first reaction. So just keep this also in mind as just a side fact that over for over 500 years, the people of Israel had not seen a, mis, a visible manifestation of Yahweh's presence. And now his first, after 500 years, his first expression to anybody is to shepherds who are despised by everyone. God really does have a sense of humor, don't you think? Don't you think that God just, um, like the, the people that he picks to do things, I just think that's, it's amazing, right? And, um, and he always makes his, um, us perfect, um, he becomes perfect through our weakness, however that verse goes, I keep going back to that verse, and um, I just think it's amazing how he chooses these people. So, um, now there was, um, so it's, um, Sorry, I'm just finding my place in my notes. Um, so today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. So it's a big question of what the shepherds actually understood about them. And so if, um, if that wasn't enough to get the shepherds on the move, then it says, and suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude. So now at first there was only a few, and that light must have been amazingly, um, God's glory must have been shocking. And now all of a sudden there's a choir, there's this multitude of angels of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among men. I just can't even imagine how they lit up the night and how that must have, um, how that must have, um, bewildered and amazed like after the sheer uh, fear goes away they just it's, it's kind of like um we have um i don't necessarily it doesn't necessarily equate but you know how we have um fireworks right and we um are amazed by the different things well this bus um fireworks was pale in comparison to what the shepherds saw that night and so one question that we're going to talk, um, maybe if we have time at Life Group, is how do we celebrate that true meaning of Christmas? So these shepherds are, are celebrating with the multitudes of angels. Um, so what does that look like um, for us? Okay, so now I'm going to carry on here. And think about this. So the first, um, the first missionaries that we really think about in the New Testament were the despised shepherds because what did they do? They went, they they um, went to see for themselves, and then they um, they went and told everybody they knew all about it. They became like the first the first um, um, missionaries, and maybe when you think about um, what the reaction might have been for the for the um, the political um, the uh, political establishment the government if those people had actually been the first people that God announced that um, Jesus birth to um, it they, it might have become a vanity thing right he went to shepherds whose first response was wow was afraid then it was wow and let's go tell everybody we know because can you imagine how excited they were that they were the ones chosen to do this okay so then it talks about mary now what do um, mothers do when a baby is born they start a baby book right these days most people say take pictures and they make scrapbooks well mary didn't have access to that kind of stuff what she did is she treasured all these things pondering them in her heart now imagine for a moment what it must have been like when Dr. Luke, so Luke, um, Luke is written by a physician, when he went to interview Mary 40 years later about the gospel, about what happened when Jesus was born. He knew all the right questions to ask Mary. She was the source of information for this, um, for this story. And I could, I could hear her taking out her baby book, going back to that place of where she stored treasures in her memory, walking him through each moment. I, um, I have to say it might actually be quite wonderful in heaven to sit down with Mary and have a conversation with what that must have been like. But then the question begs for us is, what do we treasure in our heart? Mary treasured those moments, but what do, what do we treasure in our hearts okay so we're going to carry on to the next um passage now it's only a few verses and justice if you could get someone we'll carry on and we want to read from verses 21 to 24.
please. Hello? Can you hear me? Go ahead and Yeah. All right, uh, 20 or 21? 21. 21 to 24. Eight days later, when the baby was circumcised and he was named Jesus, the name given by the angel had angel even before he was conceived. Then it was time for their purification offering, as required by the law of Moses after the birth of a child. So his parents took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. The law of the Lord says, if a woman's first child is a boy, he must be dedicated to the Lord. So they offered the sacrifice, sorry, the sacrifice required in the law of the Lord, either a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Okay, that's really great. Thank you so much. And um, if somebody can help me out, I have to say that I meant to tour this space before, and I actually forgot. I just realized that I forgot. I have no idea where verse 25 is. So if a couple of you can go find it, and as soon as I'm done sharing here, can actually lead me to the next place, that would be quite wonderful, guys. And I've got my, um, you'll be able to hear me because I've got my voice amplified. So, okay, so almost all the great leaders of the Bible have at least one thing in common. Noah, Abraham, Moses, Joshua, some of the judges, several of the kings, King David, Esther, all the prophets, John the Baptist, Peter, James, John, Paul, all of the men and women, they were by no means perfect people. Sorry, I'm, I don't mean to stand with my back to you guys. I'll just go here a little bit so you guys can see me. Sorry about that. But they had one thing in common. And when you look at great people um, of today, where there's people like... Um, uh, Martin Luther and Wycliffe and Moody and Billy Graham and Chuck Smith, they all have the same thing in common. And almost all the people who are doing amazing things for God have this one thing in common. And what is that? They are hearers and doers of the word of God. So the question that we're going to maybe, hopefully, we have a lot of questions to explore at Life Group. So another one for us to think about is, do you dream about God using you? Of God speaking through you? Do you dream of doing great things for God? The place to start, the place to focus on, is to become a lifelong student of the Word of God, developing a habit of obedience. Now, beginning today and... Um, oh, sorry. So... Um, the next thing... Oh, um, so, jo uh, there's a... There's a bunch of people that obeyed God in this particular scenario. But if we just look at Mary and Joseph, let's just take those two as an example. So they were instructed by Jewish law that um, Jesus had to be um, circumcised within eight days, and they made sure that happened. And they um, also agreed to um, remember way back when, when the angel came to Mary and told her that she was going to become with child, and it was going to be a Holy Spirit was going to... Um, come upon her and she was going to have a child and, she, and the name of the child would be Jesus. So way back then, so now when it came to um, going into um, the temple and, um, and naming the boy, um, they did what God asked them to do. Joseph and Mary through this entire scenario are very obedient. They were asked to do a lot of things and every time they, um, they stepped up. And um, and just just as a side note, um, they were he was um, circumcised on the eighth day of a feast. It was a feast of the tabernacles, and they were treated like Sabbath days. And the eighth day was a really big party. And if you think about it, um, right now we would um, when we were having a party, we would have singing and dancing, and there'd be celebrating of so many people. Maybe like a religious Woodstock is kind of what was happening um, back then. Um, they didn't really have music. What they had was a preach-a-thon. So they would have had God together, and there'd be lots of people talking and talking and talking. So, um, okay. So the next thing we want to um, we want to move ahead. There's so much that we could talk about in this one passage, but I'm going to move ahead to the next scripture. So if somebody could lead me to where verse 25 is, that would be awesome. Has anybody found verse 25? I can't find it, uh, Donna. I don't know if you know what that's just found. I just couldn't find it. 
Seriously, it's nowhere? Like it's not around the backside either? No, I just had to look right around. I couldn't find it. Oh, well, how interesting is that? Okay, well, I'm very sorry about this, but I guess um, it's this. Um, I guess that I'll just um, read. I apologize for that. I can't believe I never thought to look before. I don't know what happened. Okay, so the next thing we have is the. So if you guys don't mind, I will just um, stand here, and I'm going to just move back so that I'm. I don't think I have my back to many people. It's anybody right now. Okay, is this good for everybody? Give me some hearts if you're good. If I stay here for a while. Is that good with you guys? Okay, sweet. So the next thing we're going to talk about is the prophecy of Simeon. So at that time, there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon. He was righteous and devout and was eagerly waiting for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. The Holy Spirit was upon him and had revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. That day, the Spirit led him to the temple. So when Mary and Joseph came to present the baby, there's so much perfect timing, you guys, in God's plan. There's so much perfect timing. So Simeon's waiting for a promise to be um, fulfilled. And on the eighth day, um, he's led to the temple. And there's where Mary and Joseph came to present baby Jesus to the Lord as the law required. Simeon was there. He took the child in his arms. And he praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace. As you have promised, I have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all people. He is the light to reveal God to the nations, and he is the glory of your people Israel. So Jesus' parents were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them. And he said to Mary, the baby's mother, This child is destined to cause many in Israel to fall and many others to rise. He has been sent as a sign from God, but many will oppose him. As a result, the deepest thoughts of my hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your very soul. So, if, um, this is... Um, okay. Uh, the, oh, sorry, you guys. I want to talk about uh, the fact that on... Um, what God wants to, what the Spirit of God wants to teach us as we come to Christmas Eve. So in this song, in this um, prophecy of Simeon, he says, Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace. That, um, let his birth prepare you to die. It has been, um, he says that um, the birth was not to be overlooked, for many eyes have seen your salvation. So he, this was the last thing that had to happen before um, Simeon died, so or was going to die. So this was part of the preparation for that. Sorry, I lost my train of thought for that one, and so I'm going to skip over it. That ought to be really good in the video, right? Um, let his life prepare you to suffer. In verse 34 and 35, Simeon looks at Mary and says, Indeed, this child is destined to call the fall, cause the fall and rise of many in Israel. So that Mary, this baby, is going to divide this nation. So you're going to, um, aside from heaven, that marks the end of neutrality about God. You're going to be either for him or against him. There's no middle ground. Jesus' birth will lift up the lowly and bring down the mighty. He will unite some and divide some. People will love him and follow him or hate him and reject him. That, um, and that's a decision that each one of us is going to make, right? And um, I think that um, there's, again, more that we could say, but it's um, this is a long chapter. So um, we're going to carry on to the next section, which is called the Prophecy of Anna. Anna, and so the, I'm reading from verses 36 to 40. Anna, a prophet was also there in the temple. She was the daughter of um, Phanuel from the tribe of Asher, and she was very old. Her husband died when they had been married for only seven years. Then she lived as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but stayed there day and night, worshiping God 
fasting, and with prayer. She came along just as Simeon was talking with Mary and Joseph, and she began praising God. She talked about the child to everyone who had been waiting expectantly for God to rescue Jerusalem. When Jesus' parents had fulfilled all their requirements of the law of the Lord, they returned home to Nazareth in Galilee. There the child grew up healthy and strong. He was filled with wisdom, and God's favor was on him. So these few chapters actually cover like a great span of time. But Anna was a prophet who has the, actually the final word on the nativity stories in the book of Luke to underscore the importance of the world changing birth of Jesus Christ. What burns within Anna is the need and the desire to tell others about the life transforming salvation offered through Jesus Christ. That's something, that's a challenge for us, right? Do we have that burning desire to share the, um, the story of salvation, the love of God with the people around us? D does that burn? Like, um, is it a soul focus? There's another person, John the Baptist, whose soul focus was to prepare the way of the Lord um, and prepare that, um, the way for Jesus. And here is Anna, who is a prophet, and that, this is her sole purpose. And um, ima I imagine this is what Anna was like in the temple, holding the baby Jesus, telling everybody um, she would be like a grandma um, who um, adores her grandchildren. Right? I just met tonight. I was at an event personally, and I met a woman that I haven't seen for a while. And since the last time I seen her, she had two grandchildren born. And she said, oh, my gosh, Dawn, I cannot believe how exciting this is, right? And she, she just spewed all of this stuff about how great it was to be a grandma. And that's kind of what Anna sounded like in the, pro, in the um, temple. She was so excited about this birth, and that's how she, um, that enthusiasm is contagious, right? When you have somebody that's just so passionate about something, that, that enthusiasm is contagious. Um, so she could see what, what's coming. She had the foresight to tell then that Jesus Christ is the only one sent by God and who will change the world. And so um, it's our privilege this Christmas season to live the lesson of Anna and tell others about Christ and the salvation that he offers. So now we're going to, um, so that takes us to the, hang on, I'm just going to get my, so if you saw the papers on my desk. Um, so the fact that um, Jesus speaks with the teachers. So if this is verse 41 to 52. So every year Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. When Jesus was 12 years old, they attended the festival as usual. So now we've gone for the birth of Jesus. Um, excuse me, guest. I assume you're guest. Could you just stand back? I, uh, that would be um, really, that would be appreciated. Thank you so much. So, um, sorry, after the celebration, so Jesus is 12 years old. So we've gone from the birth of Jesus to the announcement of Jesus right through to now when he's 12 years old. After the celebration was over, they started home to Nazareth, but Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents didn't miss him at first because they assumed he was among the young travelers. But when he didn't show up that evening, they started looking for him amongst their relatives and friends. When they couldn't find him, they went back to Jerusalem to search for him there. Three days later, they finally discovered him in the temple, sitting there amongst the religious teachers, listening to them and asking questions. All who heard him were amazed at his understanding, um, at his understanding and his answers. His parents didn't know what to think. Son, his mother said to him, why have you done this to us? Your father and I have been frantic, searching for you everywhere. But why do you need to search, he said. Didn't you know that I must be in my father's house? But they didn't understand what he meant. Then he returned to Nazareth with them, and he was obedient to them. And his mother stored all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and all the people. So that takes us through um, um, to the end of the chapter of um, Luke chapter two, and I can um, I can imagine how frantic. I don't even need to be a parent. I don't have children. I don't need to be a parent to understand what it must have been like for um, a child to go missing, 
and you're looking all over the place and you cannot find the child and you're thinking about the worst and you're getting um, you're getting just crazy and then you find him in the temple and um, the fact that Mary and Joseph had um, they've been asked to do so much they've been obedient for so long and now they have a child who is um, spending time at, in the temple and um, they didn't have the um, there was no angel to share with them what was going on there was no angel to tell them not to be afraid and it must have been a confusing time um, for those uh, for the parents um, but it's interesting that for um, Jesus lived on earth for 33 years and so for the and um, his ministry out of that his actual ministry lasted three years so for those 30 years we have very little information about what happened in those 30 years what amazes me is that he lived without sin so God came to save us he came to rescue us he came to die for us he came to pay the price for us and he did that by taking our form he took human form and he lived the way we did and during that time he um, endured the same um, things that we would um, when we get frustrated when we don't know why he was a carpenter I'm sure that um, he probably um, I can't imagine that he didn't at least once or five times hit his thumb with a hammer um, and he didn't fall to um, the temptations that we have to anger and frustration um, he did not sin and it's it's hard to imagine that but it also must um, it wasn't easy I just can't imagine it was easy just because God was divine he still took on a human form and it can't have been easy and so it's um, that's another another story in itself I guess every one of these pieces in this chapter um, that Luke writes in this story that he um, uh, picture that he paints for us every one of these pieces um, we could talk a long time about but I can um, um, I'm often curious about what happened during those years what how Mary must have been after they left the temple they don't really talk about it after he was and he was what 12 years old uh, what happened in the years after that and um, and what happened with his brothers and sisters he has brothers and sisters and um, the relationship um, with them etc so that's where Luke ends the story of um, the birth of Jesus Luke is quite a different storyteller than Matthew was. And Matthew would so matter of fact. Um, Luke paints a little bit of a different picture. Um, but it's just, it's amazing that we were given this greatest gift. And now through the month of December, as we prepare, as we, some people prepare their houses, some people do inside or out. Lots of people do celebrations. There's lots of things happening with kids. There's lots of things happening with work. Um, there's lots of interaction and goodwill, and there's lots of thanking, being grateful to everybody. And in amongst that, it is really can become difficult to remember the reason for the season, right? That's um, that's a co uh, on many um, coffee mugs and, and a motto, right, that we use. But it's so true that the reason for the season is, is really to understand that Jesus came. Um, for um, came to pay our price but he came he is our greatest gift now I mentioned at the very top of this if you guys can hang with me for a few more minutes I mentioned at the top of this that it is the fourth Sunday of Advent so um, the build here although I didn't realize we were missing verses what I did know we were missing and what we have done in the past is we've had candles so we've had a table with five candles on it and for um, up until this, every week we light one candle. So today, if you guys can just close your eyes and imagine five candles in front of you, and I'm taking a match and I'm lighting the fourth candle, and today we're going to talk about how Advent is the Latin word for coming. Sometimes you see them huddling under the bridge on the west side, Two or three of them, their hats pulled over their ears. They look like hungry prayers, their bare hands held over flame, licking off the sides of an old oil barrel. So much for chestnuts roasting on an open fire. How does Advent come? 
to a guy living out of a cardboard box behind a busy mall in mid-December. How does Advent come to that woman who slapped around in a flat over the bar serving up office Christmas parties? How does Advent come to that pregnant runaway down at the bus station who's watching everybody head home and doesn't know where her next meal will come from, where the next kind word will come from, maybe where the next clean bed will come from? You guys, each one of you has gifts, and they weren't given you to line your life with. They were given to you so that you could be a lifeline to others. You are free. And when your value and your worth and your joy and your riches are found in the greatest gift, they're found in Jesus, you are free to lavishly give away those gifts. You're asked to give away those gifts. You can see it during Advent, over on the west side of the slum, over the backyard fence, right down the hall and away, someone reaches out their hand and someone else grabs hold. There in that grip lies love. Everyone, everywhere, no matter what, is really always saying only one thing. I just want you to love me. Love amazing, love divine, the essence of Christmas. That's the gift we want. That's the gift we get. But it's also the gift that we get to give away. Christmas is a love story, the love story that has been coming from you since before time even began. Advent will keep coming. His love will keep coming again and again. The love that enveloped Abraham and Isaac, Jacob and Joseph, Samuel and David, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Mary, Elizabeth, the Magi. All of those people that we know from the lineage of Jesus, that same love has come from for us. Love, the fourth candle of Advent. No matter what your story was, today is the beginning. You were formed by love, for love. You were made for love. Advent is love come down to us, for us, and with us. The miracle of Christmas. You get more than just proof of God's existence. You get to experience God's presence. You get the good things in life, holiness and relationship. You know, the best things are never things at all, right? The miracle of Christmas. The miracle that is the love story that's been coming for us. We can always have. You guys, we can always have as much of Jesus as we want. We can always have as much love as we want in him. And who needs more than being loved to death? God loved us to his death. God loves us that much. Love is the greatest thing that we can give God. In 1 Corinthians 13, I'm going to read the, the chapter um, quickly. Um, it's a great reminder for us. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give you all I possess to the poor and I give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. And when I was a child, I talked like a child. When I was, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put away the ways of childhood. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these things remain faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. This Christmas, if you feel left out in the cold, if you feel weary, bone tired, if you're desperate, 
Come inside. Come into the presence of God and find hope, peace, joy, and love. The Four Candles of Advent. So thank you so much, you guys. We've come to the end of what I had prepared for today. I'm happy to carry on a conversation. If you guys don't mind, I will just um, close in prayer. And, um, and then anybody that um, has to leave, I totally understand. And anybody that wants to stick around, we're happy to have a conversation. Dear God, we come before you and we thank you so much as we are coming into the fourth day of Advent, as we've been experiencing weeks of your coming, as we've been experiencing time in your presence, as we've been taking um, time to be still, to let you come to us, to sit in your presence. We just thank you so much for the blessings that you've bestowed on us. And we look at the responsibility you've given us to share those gifts. You didn't give us gifts so we could hoard them. You gave us gifts so we could give them all away as life-wise to the people around us in the small tasks we do and the obedience we have to you and the actions that you ask us to do. You have this big jigsaw puzzle. You know the plan and there's all these little pieces and every time you ask us to be obedient, it's just like adding another piece to that jigsaw puzzle. And we just ask that you give us a heart of obedience and that you give us a heart of loving compassion for those around us. And as we think about the amazing love that you brought down to earth for us, we ask that, we should, we ask that you help us share that same love with those around us, with those that sometimes our first reaction is they don't deserve our love. Help us remember that you love every single person with that unconditional, unwavering, unquestionable love that brought you to earth as a child, you left your divinity and came to earth so that you could die for us, so that we could find you. Thank you so much for coming to find us. I ask that you be with everybody that's at this service today, has challenges coming up in the next week. We just pray a hand of blessing on each person. And as everyone leaves this place, that your unconditional love leaves with them that stays with them. We ask these things in your precious name. Amen. Well, thank you, everyone.